Um, so let us begin by looking at some emotions. So we're talking today, uh, the, the session today is talking about big climate emotions um, and something that, that Helen actually came up with that name, I believe. Uh, it wasn't me. Um, because I want to ask you something. Um, when we're looking at the climate crisis, you know, let's not call it climate change anymore. Um, I'd like you to to raise your hand if you've ever felt any of, of these emotions. So have, have you ever, has anyone ever felt scared? Yeah, okay, some people have felt scared. Okay, I was gonna say that's good to hear, but obviously it's not actually good to hear, but it, it is something to hear. Uh, has anybody ever felt motivated? Do you know how hard it is to come up with a photo of motivated? It's really difficult. Um, I went for a kind of rocky pose there. Uh, how about, has anyone ever felt powerless? Yeah, good. No, again, not good, but bad, I guess. Uh, uh, has anyone ever felt uninterested? That's me trying to get through Ulysses there. Um, was not my finest hour. Uh, and then this last one. Has anyone ever felt or been made to feel guilty? Yeah, that's me doing my favourite uh, my favorite guilty pleasure. I like to call it Nutella fingers. Um, because who's got time to get a spoon nowadays? I mean, I obviously don't. Uh, it took quite a lot of beard cleaning after that. So it's, it's pretty obvious to see that that eco-anxiety isn't just eco-anxiety anymore. Um, it's a lot more than that. It's a it's a broad, it's an umbrella term really for these, these big emotions that we're having. They are huge emotions that we're having. And, and I found this, this wonderful um, emotions wheel, which uh, will be made available to you because I have sent all of this to, to Helen. So she will be able to send it to you. It's from the, the Climate Mental Health Network based on some uh, research by Panal Figala. Sorry if I've said your name wrong. You're not here, but I apologize in advance if you are watching back in future. Um, and these are those big emotions wheels that I'm absolutely certain your students have probably felt, particularly if they are in your classroom. You know, they will have felt that fear with that powerlessness. They will have felt the anger, you know, the frustration, the betrayal. Has anybody been paying attention to the news in the UK recently? Um, if anybody hasn't felt betrayal at what the Tory government are doing at the moment with their flip-flopping on the food waste bill and the um, Rose Bank and all of these things, if you haven't felt betrayed, then um, you're, prob you're probably having issues with your emotions and maybe you're a sociopath. So I would check that one out. There is an awful lot of feeling of betrayal, which can often lead to, you know, this grief and, and this despair and this powerlessness and this panic and all of these horrible negative emotions that are coming out of it but but we can use these negative emotions we can take these negative emotions and we can translate them into something that is a lot more positive you know we can feel empowered and motivated and we can find hope within the actions of others so when we see this happening in our students it's really important that we try and find the other side as well we do need anger you know, we need that. If we don't have anger, what's going to motivate us to make a change, to make a difference? You know, we're not just going to suddenly be like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling great. So what I'm going to do is go out there and try and make a change. And it needs to go beyond simply telling our students, hey, don't forget to turn off the tap while you brush your teeth or, or that classic. I'm going to grab that famous hat there that I had on beforehand. Yeah, but it's OK, because I spend 17 hours a week sorting out my recycling, so it's all good. Um, we need to go beyond that. We need to move beyond that and, and harness these, these big eco emotions. And we need to move far beyond that and move into these positive things, which you know use the outrage, use the indignation to motivate us to go forward. And you know we need to make sure that our classrooms are a safe space for our students. 
I've noticed there's this kind of catch 22 in, in a lot of my classes that the more my students know about the climate crisis, the more worried they get. So you kind of have this feeling of, should I be teaching them these things that are scary? Because they're scary. It's scary, let's be honest. And you kind of have that feeling of, <laughs> should I just shy away from it? And a lot of teachers have that feeling. I know that none of you will have that feeling, but perhaps the people you're training or you're working with have that thought, I don't want to cause anxiety in my students. But the more we know, the more we grow, as Dr. Zeus once said. Um, and he did actually write some very fine books, although apparently he was a massive racist. So not the best thing in the world there. But anyway, I'd like to just use a quote here from one of my favorite humans in the world, one of my absolute heroes. And we have to be able to create a space where these big um, for these big emotions without judgment. This needs to be one of the high things on our agenda that we do create this space that there is no judgment. Now, I know that you know when I look at my daughter and I look at these young people today who are becoming climate activists, they're often a lot like Clover Hogan was when she when she started out as an activist. And I'm going to share my screen and hopefully remember to share my sound. Uh, and in that moment, we're just going to watch a couple of minutes of her keynote speech uh, from Change Now this year. And it's all about this idea of being this perfect environmentalist. Because when you do try to be this perfect environmentalist, the whole world kind of falls down around you because you lose the power that you have. And I didn't share the sound, so... I'm going to unshare again and go back in and share. My apologies. Schoolboy error. It's like I've never used Zoom before. So we don't need to see double me there. Let's go over onto the... Oh, shit. Wrong desk. My screen is loading. It's loading. It stopped loading. Oh, here we go. He's doing well today. How about this one? Let's try now. Can you see an empty screen? Hopefully you can all see an empty screen there because I've got Clover on big, so she's just hidden away. Can we all see Clover? Can anyone see Clover? Yes, we can see. Excellent. So hopefully you'll be able to hear her as well. Um, and this was a part of her keynote speech. I recommend everybody watches this. The link will appear in the chat at some point. I'll be quiet now and, uh, and we'll listen to Clover. So when I turned 11, I declared to my parents over dinner that I wanted to become an activist. Now, it was a bold statement built on a promise to myself that I wouldn't just be an activist, but I would be the most devout activist possible. 12 years later, and I'm a strict vegetarian except for when I gorge on salmon sushi, uh, kitchen lights off, should anyone discover my shameful secret. Like my boyfriend, who I only half-jokingly remind meat is murder every time he tries to order a hamburger. I don't shop fast fashion, except for socks. No matter how sustainable I want to be, I just can't justify 12 euro on a bit of eco cloth to swaddle my feet. And come to think of it, I haven't really had to buy fashion for some time because of the amount I'm gifted by brands hoping I'll model them to my meager Instagram following. I refuse to drive a car, AKA a gas-guzzling, uh, planet-destroying combustion engine. Except when it's an absolute emergency. Like when it's raining. Or, when the idea of cozying up to a stranger on the bus is enough to make me want to throw myself in front of one. I've posted petitions against the destructive uh, and toxic mining of copper and lithium from devices that would not function without them. Over the past decade, my idealistic activism has become a parade of caveats and contradictions. So I'm going to I'm going to stop it there. 
the, it goes on. It's absolutely brilliant. I really recommend everybody gives it a watch. She is also a part of the, um, and she has an inter she does an interview with me in today's renewable English. So do go along, check that out. Um, and it's that idea that we need to be perfect. And when we are being as perfect as we can, we realize that we're not actually stopping the climate crisis. And suddenly that brings about a bit more anxiety and that brings about more worry. So ensuring that our students know there is no need to be perfect. Do your best, do better every single day, do better than the day before. But even if you're a vegan who never flies, that never uses fast fashion, that doesn't go anywhere near a car, the impact that that's gonna have will be minimal. The biggest impact, the only thing that we can genuinely change is our mindset. We can change our mindset. And with that change in mindset, we can understand that there are things that are beyond us. There are things that are bigger than us. But we can continue to try and make changes within those. We can continue lobbying. We can work on campaigns with our students to, to make differences in local areas. Because that's the thing that we can change. No, we're not going to reverse global warming at the drop of a hat. Because let's be honest, who would like to drop a hat anyway? The best place that hats are are on our heads. Um, it's so important that our students understand that it isn't on them. It isn't up to them. You know, we keep saying that, you know, this is their future that we're playing with. This is their future that we're destroying. We're actually destroying all of our futures because I imagine most of us plan on being around for at least another 20 or so years. Um, and I can say the change in the last 10 years has been pretty enormous. So making sure our students are aware that the changes they make in their lives will make a difference, but it will be to their mindset. And it will show that they can do those positive things, but it is also okay, and I apologize for my language in advance, it's okay to be absolutely shit scared from time to time, because that's gonna happen. It does happen, and it's natural for that thing to happen. Eco-anxiety and the emotions that come with it are perfectly natural and normal things that are going to happen. So let's get back to the session. So we've heard what eco-anxiety is, Let's have a look at what it isn't. Um, it isn't. It isn't your fault. It isn't an illness. And it absolutely isn't new. So something that I have made the, the mistake of saying on a number of occasions, and that is to talk about suffering from eco-anxiety. We don't suffer from eco-anxiety. We experience eco-anxiety. If the anxiety part of eco-anxiety does become too much. Just remember, you are probably not a qualified professional to help your students with that. And a good idea would be for them to seek professional help. So do be aware that that is possible, that it may become too much for some students and it may come on top of them. And in that instance, they do need to be referred to a, a medical health professional. Make sure you're there, but keep your eye on it. And remember, this isn't a new thing. This is something people have been experiencing for a long, long time. And again, the last point there, the bottom point of all of them, students need to know that it isn't their fault. The amount of greenwashing there is every single day. Now, I like to look closely at greenwashing. It's a bit of a blanket term. I like to look at green shifting, which is something that governments and, and huge organizations do. And that is when they shift the blame onto the individuals. We can look at BP back in 2003 when they invented the, um, the, the carbon footprint calculator. You'll see about that in Clover's speech there. That's shifting the blame onto the individual, making you think that everything you do is absolutely your fault. Um, I live in the south of Spain uh, where it's apparently spring again here. We've got the orange blossom out on the trees again because it rained for the first time in about six months, a couple of weeks back, and now it's back to being 37 degrees again. So everything's all a bit confused, but we are in the middle of a drought. And we received at the start of summer, a bit of green shifting from our local government saying, make sure you take shorter showers, make sure you don't wash your car using your hose pipe, buy bottled water instead of drinking it from the tap because that's less wasteful. So rather than them, 
turning off the sprinklers in the town, turning off the sprinklers to keep the grass green, um, instead of them putting in you know restrictions for any of the the local golf courses, instead of them um, trying to to fight for the the fast fashion companies around here and the factories to use less water when they're producing their materials. No, no, they shift it onto the individual and they make you feel guilt. They make you feel the blame. And oh, do not get me started on the strawberry farms, Daniel, because I will not stop. I am so mad right now. Strawberries don't belong in November. They shouldn't be around in November. So why are they draining the beautiful wetlands of Doniana dry to keep the strawberries? Because people keep buying them. I'm going to stop now or I will go absolutely. Yeah. Um, and breathe. Thanks for that, Dan. You're my hero. Um, I'm going to pay you back for that, Athea, and give you something else. Um, so why does it happen? Why does it happen? I, I'm going to just reveal these. I'm not going to I'm not going to make you try and guess what the different things are. Um, there are lots of reasons for eco anxiety. In fact, there are hundreds of reasons you could probably add to this list in in a second. Um, but these are the five that I think are the are the main the main five that I've noticed when I've spoken to students when I've um, talked to them. This idea of experiencing an ecological event. So I feel at the moment in in Spain in the in in Andalusia, I, I currently feel like I'm experiencing an ecological event because it's almost October and it's 37 degrees and I'm sweating buckets. And I did tell Joanne that I might come on completely naked. She said it would be okay, but there'd have to be a warning. So if I do accidentally strip down, I apologize. It's only because I'm way too hot. I may even have to change hat because this one's going to be soaked through in no time. Um, doom scrolling, which is a brilliant word to use with your teams because they have no idea what it is at first. They have no idea. I'm sure you all know what doom scrolling is. It's when you, you jump onto Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever it is, and you just go through all the terrible, awful things that Rishi Sunak is doing. Um, and you just get really sad and angry and depressed and think that nothing's good's going to happen. Try and avoid that. Um, it's not easy, but try and avoid that. Try and maybe look for some happiness scrolling. Look for some of the good things that are happening. Look for the awesome people that are that are saving local birds in the Cadiz region. Look for look for the the local heroes that are that are cleaning up areas and and trying to pick up a million pieces of litter um, by next June the twenty third. If you don't know about that, you really should check out uh, Ali's campaign for Kids Against Plastic. Um, Governmental inaction or just government inaction. Um, I'm not sure why I put governmental. Could have just put government. Government inaction. Um, if you don't live in France, then this is probably how you're feeling at the moment. Or maybe Costa Rica. I don't know if anyone here lives in Costa Rica. Uh, so interesting, the economic anxiety not caused by... <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. It does... It isn't really up there on the list of things. Constructively talking about, you know, the environment and eco-anxiety doesn't usually cause it. It does usually kind of give us the tools more so to deal with it. Um, there are some governments that are doing things. Point your local government towards these, these different activities. Look towards your local government rather than your national government, because that's the place where you and your students can actually make that change. You know, if your national government is deciding that what they're going to do is go out and, and drill for oil in the North Sea because they want to then sell it on to other people and pretend to you that it's going to lower your electricity bills, then, you know, that's going to happen. But go to your local government, campaign with your local MP, send letters and, and try and make this thing stop. Sign petitions and try and fight this, this terrible government inaction. And that will make you feel that maybe you don't, there isn't a sense of powerlessness because you do have power. Every single one of us has power. Every single one of us has the power to do something. And when we work together, we have even more power. That power is multiplied. And working together to make changes in these, these different areas, it's such a positive thing for you know the way we're feeling, for these negative emotions. I know that you know, when I wake up in the morning and I'm not 
feeling great, which probably happens maybe, I don't know, three days out of seven, I wake up with not the most positive climate emotions um, upon me. I tend to go out, I'll go and do a litter pick. I'll do something positive. Um, it's not an altruistic thing in this case. This isn't me doing something to try and make the world a better place. This is me doing something to try and make myself feel better that I am actually doing something to show me that I, I'm not powerless. You know, maybe I'll go and sign a petition. They're these small actions that we can do that can make a difference. And this last one here is hugely obvious within education. It is changing in certain areas of, you know, in ELT, there are areas that it's coming up. There are wonderful groups like this, like ELT Footprint. There are some publishers that are slowly making changes. Um, some are even doing, you know, a nice bit of green lighting. By the way, that's another part of greenwashing when they show one thing that they do really well, while at the same time they're doing, you know, horrible things. It's a bit like looking someone in the eye and smiling while you're taking a piss on their carpet. Um, that kind of thing. A lot of, you know, these these uh, publishers are doing that. You know, I I know I am I am guilty to be one of the people that is being greenlighted with a number of of different publishers. But some publishers are making changes and are trying to make genuine differences. Is it fast enough? I don't know. Are these things going to change? Hopefully soon, because we can continue to make the noise and make a difference. And our students can do the same. They can continue to have their voices heard. So where do we start? Nice little pun there. Uh, where do we start? Obviously, uh, these are some statistics that have been gathered from various different areas across um, the UK. There are a number of different studies that have been done. where ranging from about, you know, well, 57 percent, as we see here, to 75 percent of children are suffering from environmental anxiety. There are huge numbers of students that are feeling nervous about the climate. Um, and a lot of they they're all on there they're all on there in the in the brackets uh so this has come from it says it at the bottom there I'll move it up a bit higher this this infographic has been taken from a blog which is there and all of the sources are within the within the infographic but it isn't particularly clear so we do have RCP psych FE news um the BBC news round um and the metal packaging manufacturers association um, so the one that really like, jumps out at me is the one in five children have had a bad dream about climate change. Uh, that was something that really kind of, it really worried me because I've seen my daughter when she has a bad dream and like that she's, she's inconsolable. And if this is happening about climate change, this is the climate crisis. It's within their subconscious, you know, it's, it's pen, it's gone beyond simply them being a bit worried about it. It's, it's, deep seated it's within their subconscious something that you know obviously we need to be making huge changes yeah i apologize for the blurriness daniel it's i, I blame my streaming software um it's, it's absolutely not my fault how could it ever possibly be my fault so so these different um statistics are something that that really worry me but the one that worries me the most is the half teachers admit they are not equipped to deal with student anxiety around climate change as teachers, half of us don't feel equipped and possibly half of the other half don't even really know what it is. So, you know, there's a small minority of teachers that feel like we are in a position to do something. I feel confident that I might be able to do something if, you know, when my students are experiencing it, but I don't know if other people do. So if anybody does have any ideas or any questions, please feel free. My door is always open. Um, it's a long way to come, so it's probably easier to just email me or contact me through social media, but my door is genuinely always open. Um, it's really warm, it creates a draft, don't have to use AC. Uh, so these, these stats kind of, they worried me a little bit, um, particularly that our teachers don't feel they can really do much about it. So what, what do we do? How do we turn eco-anxiety into eco-empowerment? You know, what can we do to change this anxiety into agency? There's lots of things we can do, to be honest. And I'm sure 
the the wonderful people who are here in this um in this wonderful space have a lot of great ideas probably much better than my ideas to be honest um but what can we do well first and foremost we can we can actually address the situation uh, this is something that does need to be addressed we we need to we need to bring this up in class you know, how do we know if our students are experiencing eco anxiety well here's a question ask them ask your students how they're feeling don't tell them you know the range of emotions connected to eco anxiety is very very broad so ask them show them the wheel let them choose which one it is using eco anxiety as a reason not to teach about the climate crisis is not the answer there's no point ignoring the climate crisis um, and the effects that it has on our mental health you know if if you've got a broken leg just pretending it isn't broken won't magically fix it you do need to address these situations use your classroom as a safe space give your students a well-rounded education let them deal with these problems there are going to be times when it doesn't feel great but it has to be in the classroom it has to be brought up and it has to be a safe space be that safe space be that ear that your students can listen to this is not only for the elt this is this is for absolutely anywhere but if you're the person that can do that then be that person look at solutions you know the best way to deal with these negative feelings is to look for solutions don't only look at the negative side of things. Reframe your lessons. Look at the positive actions that are happening. Look at the good things that are changing in the world. Don't have that, you know, that mindset of there's nothing that I can do. Reframe that to be, I need to find other people that think like me so together we can work and make the changes that I'd like to make. Not, I can't make them turn off the sprinklers in the park across the road from me. Think, who else can I come to that we can go and speak to the local government and make them turn off those sprinklers um, and not just resort to breaking into the park in the night with a hammer and smashing up the sprinkler machine. I haven't actually done that yet. Um, I definitely did think about it. What they did, though, they were really clever. Um, they changed the time of the sprinklers. Um, they changed it from 9 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, they didn't realize that I'm actually a very early riser. I got up at six, went into the park and felt the grass was wet. So I went back and complained yet again. Um, so something we often talk about in, in, our, in our classes are, oh, it's really hard because of all the sacrifices that we have to make. Oh no, I can't eat meat anymore. Oh no, I can never go on holiday again because I, I, I'm not going to, ever fly again don't don't make sacrifices don't make your students make sacrifices suggest they make changes they don't have to suddenly go vegan but maybe they take meat out of their diet a few days a week maybe they stop eating beef maybe they look for a local farmer from whom they can buy their eggs um take those small steps make those small changes they stop buying their shirts in fast fashion maybe they exchange them with a friend um come up with these ideas to make these changes help your students come up with these ideas figure out the changes not the sacrifices you know they don't have to suddenly go to being yogurt weaving vegans um who you know who only ever ride their bicycle to go anywhere Sometimes you do need to get the car. And you know what? I'm going to say it. Electric cars aren't the answer either. Don't get me wrong. If someone wants to give me an electric car, that would be great. Um, but there are an awful lot of arguments behind electric cars that show they're not exactly the answer. They are definitely better, however, than buying gas guzzlers. But that's an argument and a, and a chat for another day. So these sacrifices should be reframed as changes you know talk about only what make the simple changes you know talk about only washing your clothes when necessary something people do so often is they take it off they put it in the wash every time you do a wash you're releasing 700,000 microfibers and microplastics into the water supply unless you have a filter so you could get a filter but you can also wash your clothes less often um replace your single use plastic items with reusables and refillables but if you do have to buy a, a single-use plastic item, don't beat yourself up about it. That happens. Sometimes you really, really, really need to have 
um, cherry tomatoes and you don't have time to go to the green grocers and you have to buy them from the supermarket because your salad just won't be the same without them. Okay, from time to time that does happen, but you can easily get your water bottles. You can easily ensure your students don't wrap their, their snacks in single use plastics. It's such an easy thing to do. Reuse everything as many times as you can. Once your shirt is ripped, it looks like this button's come off, um, cut your shirts down, turn them into dishcloths, whatever you want to do, and then upcycle. Do upcycling whenever you can. There are so many wonderful upcycling projects you can do. You can find them on my Instagram page. I love doing them with my students. Um, these changes aren't going to save the planet on their own, but they are going to help your students understand that the difference they are making is a positive difference. It will encourage them to take bigger steps into um, these environmental issues because you, because you can't go from zero to Greta in one lesson. You have to take those baby steps. You have to turn off the taps while you're brushing your teeth. You have to take shorter showers. You have to reduce your meat intake. These are the different things that you need to do. You can't just straight away go from, well, at the moment I'm eating 17 Big Macs a week to, oh my God, I'm gonna chain myself to a private jet because private jets are evil. If anyone has any chains or knows anyone with a private jet, let me know because I would gladly chain myself to it might be quite fun, really hate private jets. Also, Manchester City complained the other day that they couldn't fly from Newcastle back to Manchester because they'd get home late. 150 miles, shut up, come along. Anyway, again, a fight for another day. They need to make changes. That's not a sacrifice, that's a change because they're flying to Germany next week. So heaven forbid they caught a train once in a while. Um, Connect with nature. Just do it, get your students to do it. Something I always talk about all the time, every single time, get a plant or 10 for your classroom, get your students to bring a plant in, propagate your plants, grow some food in your classroom, grow some basil, it depends, well, in the UK, you'll easily be able to grow tomatoes within the next two or three years, because you know, climate change and all that. Um, but grow some things in your classroom, get your students getting their hands dirty, get your students in there, Lorena is planning a secondhand fashion show for their teens during your project. Lorena, I am clapping that. I love secondhand fashion, not so much, um, as you can probably tell by the fact I'm wearing mismatching shorts with my top. You know, fashion maybe isn't particularly high on my agenda, but I do love secondhand. Uh, it is something that I am incredibly passionate about. But yeah, get your students to go out into nature as well. You know, I, I'm not sure what the rules are where you are, if you can go out to a local park, but get your students on their way to class, on their way to school. Get them to pay attention to nature. If they're walking, get them to listen out for birds. What insects did they see? What different things could they smell? Did they see an orange blossom, an orange tree in full blossom at the end of September? Was that a bit strange? Connect to nature because when you are connected to nature, the, everything is just better. Everything is just so much better. And it is proven to reduce um, anxiety, it's proven to improve mental well being. Also, if you've got a load of plants in your classroom, CO2 levels drop. And particularly in the afternoon, especially with stinky teenagers, they will be more aware, they'll be more awake, and they'll be less sleepy particularly if your, intro, if your lesson is super fun and super interesting. So do invest in plants for your classroom or campaign for a green space in your school. Um, work on projects that can help those ideas that can make these green spaces possible. And then last of all, all of this together, try and turn anxiety into action. You know, our most, <laughs> when I started teaching, I thought my job was to teach English to my students. I didn't really realize the impact that I could have as a teacher until slowly I did. And I think our most important role as teachers is to help our students become better citizens. It isn't to make sure they can pass the B1 exam, um, even though that's what their parents endlessly go on about. Um, and you know, with our, our adult students who come in and say, you know, I'm B1, I need to be B2 next week. Um, it's not just about that. 
Perhaps that's the their end goal, but our end goal should always be to make sure they are becoming better citizens. And helping our students turn that anxiety into agency can really help them with the stresses of the climate crisis. Every time we fight against that feeling of powerless, powerlessness, it can really fight against that feeling of anxiety. These simple changes, these simple actions, like the ones we've mentioned before, can have a huge difference to our students' mindsets. And at the end of the day, that is the thing that we can change, that they can change. Set some goals. What are the things we're going to change? This class is going to be a plastic-free classroom by the end of the year. Set that goal. Do a plastic audit at the start of the year. See how much you've improved throughout the year. You can do that with the help of Kids Against Plastic. I didn't give, um, didn't give the link to Helen for that one, but it is connected to the link that I sent earlier. There are some great ideas with clothes swaps and things like that. So it's it's so common. Eco-anxiety and the symptoms are so common in the classroom. It's, it's something that we can genuinely make a difference with. So I wonder what, what you're going to do, what we are going to do to make that difference to our students today. We need to remember that, that we are here and we can make that difference. And, and, and yeah, the, the, the main thing that, that the only thing that we truly can control is our mindset, but we can also help our students change their mindset and make a difference where they can and with the things that, that they want to do in their lives as well.